Summer days mooning with weary lagooning
Hidalgo of that description, I should have preferred to ride through the streets of Venice. But owing, I presume, to an unusually wet season, <laughs> the streets are in such a condition that equestrian exercise is impracticable. No matter. Where is our suite? Your Grace, I am here. Why do you not do yourself the honor of kneeling when you address his Grace? My love, it is so small a matter. Still, you may as well do it. <laughs> the young man seems to entertain but an imperfect appreciation of the respect due from a menial to a Castilian Hidalgo. My child, you are hard upon our suite. Papa, I've no patience with the presumptions of persons in his plebeian position. If he does not appreciate that position, let him be whipped until he does. Well, let us hope the omission was not intended as a slight. I should be much hurt if I thought it was. So would he. <laughs> Where are the halberdiers who are to have had the honor of meeting us, that our visit to the Grand Inquisitor might be made in becoming state? Your Grace, the halberdiers are mercenary people who stipulated for a trifle on account. How tiresome. Well, let us hope the Grand Inquisitor is a blind gentleman. And the band who are to have had the honor of escorting us? I see no band. Hey. <laughs> Your Grace, the band are sworded persons who require to be paid in advance. Oh, that is so like a band. <laughs> Insuperable difficulties meet me at every turn. But surely they know his grace. Exactly. They know his grace. Well, let us hope the Grand Inquisitor is a deaf gentleman. Corne à piston would be something. You do not happen to possess the accomplishment of tutelling like a corne à piston? Alas, no, your grace. But I can imitate a farmyard. I don't see how that could help us. I don't see how we could bring it in. It would not help us in the least. We're not a parcel of graziers come to market. Don't. My love, our sweet's feelings. Be so good as to ring the bell and inform the Grand Inquisitor that His Grace, the Duke of Plaza Toro, Count Matadoro, Baron Picadoro, and sweets, yes, and sweet, have arrived at Venice and seek desire, ah, 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 demand, yeah, and demand an audience. Your grace has but to command. I felt sure of it. I felt sure of it. And now, my love, shall we tell her? I think so. And now, my child, prepare for a magnificent surprise. It is my agreeable duty to reveal to you a secret, which shall make you the happiest young lady in Venice. A secret? A secret which, for state reasons, it was necessary to preserve for 20 years. 
When you were a prattling babe of six months old, you were married, by proxy, to no less a personage than the infant son and heir of his majesty, the immeasurably wealthy king of Barataria. Married to the infant son of the king of Barataria? Was I consulted? <laughs> then it was a most unpardonable liberty. Consider his extreme youth and forgive him. <laughs> Shortly after that ceremony, that misguided monarch abandoned the creed of his forefathers and became a Wesleyan Methodist of the most bigoted and persecuting type. The Grand Inquisitor, determined that the innovation should not be perpetuated in Barataria, caused your smiling and infant husband to be stolen and conveyed to Venice. A fortnight since, that misguided monarch and all of his Wesleyan court were killed in an insurrection. And we are here to ascertain the whereabouts of your husband and to hail you, our daughter, as Her Majesty, the reigning queen of Barataria. Your Majesty. It is at such moments as these that one feels how necessary it is to travel with a full band. I, Queen Barataria, but I've nothing to wear. We're practically penniless. Shh. That point has not escaped me. Although I am in straitened circumstances at present, my social influence is something enormous. And a company to be called the Duke of Plaza Toro Limited is in course a formation to work me. An influential directorate has been secured, and I shall myself join the board after allotment. Am I to understand that the Queen of Barataria could be called upon at any time to witness her honored sire in the process of liquidation? The suggestion is not exempt from that drawback. Should your father stop, it will of course be necessary to, oh, uh, wind him up. But it's so undignified. It's so degrading. A grandee of Spain turned into a public company. Such a thing was never heard of. My child. The Duke of Plaza Toro does not follow fashions. He leads them. He always leads everybody. When he was in the army, he led his regiment. He occasionally led them into action. He invariably led them out of it. <laughs> in enterprise of martial kind, when there was any fighting, he led his regiment from behind, he found it less exciting. But when away his regiment ran, his place was at the Foro. That celebrated, cultivated, underrated nobleman, the Duke of Plaza Toro. In the first and foremost fight, a ha you always found that night. A ha that celebrated, cultivated, underrated nobleman, the Duke of Plaza Toro. When to evade destruction's plan to hide, they all proceeded. No soldier in that gallant band did not pass by all as he did. He lay concealed throughout the war, and so preserved his moral. That had a fight and a detected low connected warrior, the Duke of Plaza Toro. In every dozy day, are the always on the lead? Shot unless they left our service. That hero hesitated not, so marvelous is nervous. He sent his resignation in the first of all his coro. That very knowing, overflowing, easy going paladin, the Duke of Mahatoro. Two men of gross and pay, a ha ye always showed the way. A ha that's very knowing, overflowing, easy going paladin, the Duke of Mahatoro. That very knowing, overflowing, easy going paladin, the Duke of
that you will ever have reason to repent. Nay, Louise, it may not be. I have embraced you for the last time. Casilda! I have just learnt to my surprise and indignation that I was wed in babyhood to the infant son of the King of Barataria. The son of the King of Barataria? The child who was stolen in infancy by the Inquisition? The same, but of course you know his story. Know his story? Why, I have often told you that my mother was the nurse to whose charge he was entrusted. True, I had forgotten. Well, he's been discovered, and my father has brought me here to claim his hand. But you will not recognize this marriage. It took place when you were too young to understand its import. Nay, Louise, respect my principles and cease to torture me with vain entreaties. Henceforth, my life is another's. But stay! The present and the future, they are another's, but the past, that at least is ours, and none can take it from us. As we may revel in naught else, let us revel in that. I don't think I grasp your meaning. It is logical enough. You say you cease to love me? I say I may not love you. Ah, but you do not say you did not love me. I loved you with a frenzy that words are powerless to express. And that but ten brief minutes since. Exactly. My own, that is, until ten minutes since, my own. My lately loved, my recently adored, tell me that until, say, a quarter of an hour ago, I was all in all to thee. I see your idea. It's ingenious, but don't do that. There can be no harm in reveling in the past. None whatever. But an embrace cannot be taken to act retrospectively. Perhaps not. We may recollect an embrace. I recollect many. But we must not repeat them. Well, then let us recollect a few. Ah, <laughs> oh, Casilda, you were to me as the sun is to the earth. A quarter of an hour ago? <laughs> About that. And to think that, but for this miserable discovery, you would have been my own for life. Through life and death, a quarter of an hour ago. How greedily my thirsty ears would have drunk the golden melody of those sweet words, a quarter. Well, now it's about... <laughs> Twenty minutes since. About that. In such a matter, one cannot be too precise. And now our love, so full of life, is but a silent, solemn memory. Must it be so, Casilda? Louise, it must be so. <laughs>
Unexpectedly called upon to assume the functions of royalty. And a very nice little lady, too. Allow me. Naughty temper. You must take some allowance. Her Majesty's head is a little turned by her access of dignity. I could have wished that Her Majesty's access of dignity had turned in this direction. Unfortunately, if I am not mistaken, there seems to be some little doubt as to His Majesty's whereabouts. A doubt as to his whereabouts? Then we may yet be saved. A doubt? Oh dear, no, no doubt at all. He is here in Venice, playing the modest but picturesque calling of a gondolier. I can give you his address. I see him every day. In the entire annals of our history, there is absolutely nothing so free from all manner of doubt of any kind whatever. Listen, and I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> I stole the prince and I brought him here and left him gaily prattling with a highly respectable gondolier who promised the royal babe to rear and teach him the trade of a time on near with his own beloved prattling. Both of the babes were strong and stout, considering all things clever. Of that there is no manner of doubt, no probable possible shadow of doubt, no possible doubt whatever. No possible doubt whatever. But 
knowing I'm much disposed to fear to his terrible taste for tippling. That highly respectable gondolier could never declare with a mind sincere which of the two was his offspring dear and which the royal stripling. Which was which he could never work out despite his best endeavor. Of that there is no manner of doubt, no probable possible shadow of doubt, no possible doubt whatever. No possible doubt whatever. Time sped, and when at the end of a year I sought that infant cherished, that highly respectable gondolier was lying a corpse on his humble bier. I dropped a grand inquisitor's tear that gondolier had perished. A taste for drink combined with gout had doubled him up forever. Of that there is no manner of doubt, no probable possible shadow of doubt, no possible doubt whatever. No possible doubt whatever. The children followed his old career, that statement can't be parried. Of a highly respectable gondolier, well, one of the two who will soon be here. But which of the two, it is not quite clear, is the royal prince you married. Search in and out and round about, and you'll discover never a tale so free from every doubt, a probable possible shadow of doubt, a possible doubt whatever. A tale so free from every doubt, a probable possible shadow of doubt, a possible doubt. Without any doubt of any kind, whatever. <laughs> but be reassured, the nurse to whom your husband was entrusted is the mother of that musical young man who is such a past master of that delicately modulated instrument. She can, no doubt, establish his identity beyond all question. Heavens, how did he know that? My young friend, a grand inquisitor is always up to date. His mother is at present the wife of a highly respected and old established brigand who carries on an expensive practice around the mountains of Cordoba. Accompanied by two of my emissaries, he will set off at once for his mother's address. She will return with him, and if she finds any difficulty in making up her mind, the persuasive influence of the torture chamber will jog her memory. But bless my heart, consider my position. I am the wife of one, that's very clear. But who can tell, except my intuition? Which is a prince, and which a gondolier? Submit to fate without unseemly wrangle. Such complications frequently occur. Life is one closely complicated tangle. Death is the only true unraveler. Plums, cares a canker that benumbs. Life 
lives are going to begin in real earnest. What's a bachelor? A mere nothing. He's a chrysalis. He can't be said to live. He exists. What a delightful institution marriage is. Why have we wasted all this time? Why didn't we marry ten years ago? Because you couldn't find anybody nice enough. Because you were waiting for us. I suppose that was the reason. We were waiting for you without knowing it. <laughs> Hello. Good morning. If this gentleman is an undertaker, it's a bad omen. Ceremony of some sort going on. He is an undertaker. No, just a little unimportant family gathering. Nothing in your line. Somebody's birthday, I suppose. Yes. Mine. And mine. And mine. <laughs> and mine. <laughs> Curious coincidence. And how old may all of you be? It's a rude question. But about ten minutes. <laughs> oh. Remarkably fine children. <laughs> but surely you are jesting. In other words, we were married about ten minutes since. Married? You don't mean to say you are married? Oh, yes, we are married. What? Both of you? All, All four, four of us. us. <laughs> Bless my heart, how extremely awkward. <laughs> you don't mind, I suppose. You were not thinking of either of us for yourself, I presume. Oh, Giuseppe, look at him. He was. He's heartbroken. Oh. Oh. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I wasn't. Now, my man, we want nothing in your line today. So if your curiosity is satisfied, you can go. You mustn't call me your man. It's a liberty. I don't think you know who I am. <laughs> Not we, indeed. We are jolly gondoliers, the sons of Battisto Palmieri, who led the last revolution. Republicans, heart and soul. We hold all men to be equal. As we abhor oppression, we abhor kings. As we detest vain glory, we detest rank. As we despise effeminacy, we despise wealth. We are Venetian gondoliers, your equals in everything except our calling, and to that at once we are your masters and your servants. Oh. <laughs> Bless my heart, how extremely awkward. One of you may be Baptisto's son, for anything I know to the contrary, but the other is no less a personage than the only son of the late king of Bartaria. What? And I trust, I trust, it was that one who slapped me on the shoulder and called me his man. God brothers, one of us a king. But, uh, which is it? What does it matter? As you are both Republicans and hold kings in such detestation, you'll abdicate at once. Good morning. Oh, don't do that! Wait, 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 wait. wait, wait, wait. Of course, uh, there are kings and kings. When I say I detest kings, I, I, I mean I detest bad kings. <laughs> I see. It's a delicate distinction. <laughs> Quite so. Now, I can conceive a kind of king, an ideal king, the creature of my fancy, you know, who would be absolutely unobjectionable. A king, for instance, who would abolish taxes and make everything cheap, except the gondolas. And give a great many free entertainments to the gondoliers. And light up fireworks on the Grand Canal and engage all gondolas for the occasion. <laughs> and scramble money on the Rialto among the gondoliers. <laughs> Such a king would be a blessing to his people. And if I were king, that is the sort of king that I would be. And so would I. Come, I'm glad to find your objections are not so insuperable. Oh, oh they're, they're not, not insuperable. insuperable. No, no, they're not, not insuperable. insuperable. 
Uh, besides, we are open to conviction. Oh, yes, they are open to conviction. Oh, they've often been convicted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our views may have been hastily formed on insufficient grounds. They may be crude, ill-digested, erroneous. Uh, I have a very poor opinion of the politician who is not open to conviction. Oh, he's a fine fellow. Yes, that's the sort of politician for my money. Mm -hmm. Then we'll consider it settled. Now, as the country is in a state of insurrection, it is absolutely necessary for you to assume the reins of government at once. And until it is ascertained which of you is to be king, I have arranged for you to reign jointly, as no question can arise hereafter of the validity of any of your acts. As one individual? As one individual. Like, uh, like this? Something like that. <laughs> and we may bring our friends with us and give them places about the court. Undoubtedly, that's always done. I'm convinced. And so am I. <laughs> the sooner we're off, the better. We'll just run home and pack up a few things. <laughs> stop, stop. Ladies are not admitted. What? what? Not admitted. <laughs> Later, perhaps. We'll see. Why, you don't mean to say you're going to separate us from our wives? Oh, dear, this is very awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Only for a time, a few months. After all, what is a few months? But That's 
settled, let each happy pair be reunited. Viva, this argument is strong. Viva, when I've been wanting wrong. Viva, this will be such a soon. Viva, and it was their honeymoon. Viva, viva, viva. Feels and 
find some post we undertake to find congenial with his frame of mind and all shall equal be the chancellor and his peruke the earl the marquis and the cook the groom the butler and the cook they all shall equal be the aristocrat who bangs with boots the aristocrat who hunts and shoots the aristocrat who cleans our boots they all shall equal be the noble lord who rules the state the noble lord who cleans the plate the noble lord who scrubs the grate they all shall equal be the lord high bishop orthodox the lord high coachman on the box the lord high vagabond in the stocks they all shall equal be for everyone who feels inclined some post we undertake to find congenial with his frame of mind congenial with his frame of mind and all shall equal be sing high sing low
To kings of undue pride, we're heir to act in perfect unity, whom you can order right and left with absolute impunity, who put their subjects to their ease by doing all they can to please. And thus to earn our bread and cheese, seize every opportunity. of satisfaction and good feeling. <clears throat> yes, I say, we are much obliged to you for your expressions of satisfaction and good feeling. We heard you. <laughs> we are delighted at any time to fall in with sentiments so charmingly expressed. That's all right. <clears throat> Um, at uh, the same time, there is just uh, uh, one little grievance we would like to ventilate. What? <laughs> Don't be alarmed. It's not serious. <clears throat> it is arranged that, until it is decided which of us two is the actual king, we are to act as one person. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, although we act as one person, we are, in point of fact, Two persons. I don't think we can go into that. It is a legal fiction, and legal fictions are solemn things. Situated as we are, we can't recognize two independent responsibilities. No, but you can recognize two independent appetites. It is all very well to say that we act as one person, but when you supply us with only one ration between us, I would describe it as a legal fiction carried a little too far. It's rather a nice point. I don't like to express an opinion offhand. Suppose we reserve it for an argument before the full court. Yes, but what are we to do in the meantime? We want our tea! <laughs> I think. We may make an interim order for double rations on their majesties entering into the usual undertaking to indemnify in the event of an adverse decision. What? Yes, yes, I think that will meet the case. But you'll have to work hard and, and stick to it. Nothing like work. Oh, certainly. <laughs> we quite understand that a man who holds the magnificent position of king should do something to justify it. We are called your majesty. We are allowed to buy ourselves magnificent clothes. Our subjects frequently nod to us in the streets. The centuries always return our salutes. And we enjoy the inestimable privilege of heading the subscription lists to all the principal charities. In return for these advantages, the least that we can do is make ourselves useful about the palace. <laughs> First we polish off some batches of political dispatches and foreign politicians circumvent. Then if business isn't heavy, we may hold a royal levy or ratify some acts of parliament. Then we probably review the household troops. 
with the usual shallow humps and shallow boots, or received with ceremonial and state an interesting Eastern potentate. After that, we turn her rally, go and dress our private valley. It's a rather nervous duty, he's a touchy little man. Write some letters literary for our private secretary. He is shaky in his spelling, so we help him if we can. Then in view of cravings dinner, we go down and order dinner. Then we polish the regalia and the coronation plate. Spend an hour titillating all our gentlemen in waiting, or we run our little errands for the ministers of state. Oh, philosophers may sing of the troubles of a king, yet the duties are delightful and the privilege is great. And the privilege and pleasure that we treasure beyond measure is to run our little errands for the ministers of state. Oh, philosophers may sing of the troubles of a king, but the duties are delightful and the privilege is great. And the privilege and pleasure that we treasure beyond measure is to run our little errands for the ministers of state. After lunch and making merry on a bun and glass of sherry, if we've nothing in particular to do, we may make a proclamation or receive a deputation or possibly create a peer or two. Then we help a fellow creature on his path with the cutler or the thistle or the bath. Or we dress and toddle off in semi-state to a festival, a function, or a fete. After that, we stand a sentry at the palace private entry, marching hither, marching thither, up and down and to and fro, while the warrior on duty goes in search of beer and beauty. And it generally happens that he hasn't far to go. He relieves us if he's able, just in time to lay the table. Then we dine and serve the coffee, and at half past twelve or one. <laughs> With a feeling that's emphatic, we retire to our attic with the gratifying feeling that our duty has been done. Oh. Philosophers may sing of the troubles of a king, yet of pleasures there are many, and of worries there are none. And the culminating pleasure that we treasure beyond measure is the gratifying feeling that our duty has been done. quite selfish. Almost like we're taking advantage of their good feeling. How nice they were about the double rations. Oh, most considerate. Oh, there is only one thing to make us thoroughly comfortable. And that is? The dear little wives we left behind us three months ago. Oh, yeah, them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is dull without female society. We can do without everything else, but we can't do without that. And if we have that in perfection, we have everything. There is only one recipe for true happiness. Parenthesis. 
Wednesday. Would you say goodbye to sister? Wednesday, Izzy, have you got to get up early in the morning? If you do what you ought not to do, they give the usual warning. With a horse do they equip you? Lots of trumpeting and drumming. Do the royal dreams which you do? If the livery be coming. Does your human being intercede on everything that nice is? Do they give you wine for dinner? Kicks or sugar? Plums and ice and wish on one go on the quest until you tell us never. celebrate the commencement of our honeymoon. Gentlemen, will you allow us to offer you a magnificent banquet? We, we will. will. Ah, oh, thanks very much. <laughs> and ladies, what do you say to a dance? <gasps> a banquet and a dance?
fancy ball. No, just a friendly little dance, <laughs> that's all. Uh, sorry you're late. But I saw a groom dancing. And a footman. Yes, that was the Lord High Footman. And, and dear me, a common little drummer boy. Oh, no, 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 no. That was the Lord High Drummer Boy. <laughs> but surely the servants' hall is a place for these gentry. Oh, dear, no. We have appropriated the servants' hall. It is now the Royal Apartment and accessible only by tickets attainable at the Lord Chamberlain's office. We really must have some place to call our own. I'm afraid I'm not quite equal to the intellectual pressures of the conversation. <laughs> well, you see, the monarchy has been remodeled on Republican principles. What? All departments rank equally, and everyone is at the head of his department. I see. I'm afraid you're annoyed. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't say that. It's just not what I expected. Well, I'm, I'm awfully sorry. And so am I. Oh, by the by, can I offer you anything after your voyage? A, a plate of macaroni, perhaps, and a rusk? No, no, nothing, nothing. Obliged to be careful. Yes. Gluten-free. <laughs> you see, in every court there are certain distinctions that must be observed. Oh, oh there are, are there? <laughs> But of course, for instance, you wouldn't have a Lord High Chancellor play leapfrog with his own cook. Why not? Why not? Because a Lord High Chancellor is a personage of great dignity, who should never, under any circumstances, be asked to tuck in his tuppany, except by a nobleman of his own rank. A Lord High Archbishop, for instance, could ask a Lord High Chancellor to tuck in his tuppany, but certainly not a cook, gentlemen. Certainly not a cook. Not even a Lord High Cook? <laughs> My dear friend, that is not a rent that is recognized by the Lord Chamberlain's office. No, no, it certainly won't do. I'll give you an instance in which the experiment was tried. <laughs> There lived a king, as I've been told, in the wonder-working days of old, when hearts were twice as good as gold, and twenty times as mellow. Good temper triumphed in his face, and in his heart he found a place for all the erring human race, and every wretched fellow. When he had Rhenish wine to drink, it made him very sad to think that some a junket or a chick must be content with toddy, with toddy, must be content with toddy. He wished all men as rich as he, and he was rich as rich could be. So to the top of every tree promoted everybody. Now that's the kind of king for me. He wished all men as rich as me. So to the top of every tree promoted everybody. Lord chancellors were cheap as frats and bishops in their shovel hats were plentiful as tabby cats. A point of fact to many ambassadors cropped up like a prime ministers and such as they you like asparagus in me and dukes were three a penny on every side field marshal gleam small beer were lord lieutenant's dream where had barrels the ocean team around his wide dominions with 
admirals around his white dominions, and party leaders you might meet in twos and threes in every street, maintaining with no little heat their various opinions. Now that's a sight you couldn't beat to party leaders in each street, maintaining with no little heat their various opinions. That king, although no one denies his heart was of abnormal size, yet he had acted otherwise if he had been acute. The end is easily foretold when every blessed thing you hold is made of silver or of gold. You long for simple pewter when you have nothing else to wear but cloth of gold and satin rare. Of cloth of gold you cease to care. Up goes the price of shoddy, of shoddy. Short, whoever you may be, to this conclusion you'll agree when everyone is somebody, then no one's anybody. Now that's as plain as plain can be, to this conclusion we agree when everyone is somebody, then no one's anybody. Important news to communicate. His Grace, the Duke of Plazator, Her Grace, the Duchess, and their beautiful daughter, Casilda. I said, their beautiful daughter, Casilda. Uh, we heard you. <laughs> have just arrived in Bartaria and will be here at any moment. The Duke and Duchess are nothing to us. But the daughter. The beautiful daughter! Oh, you're a lucky dog, one of you. I think you're a very uh, incomprehensible old gentleman. Not a bit. <laughs> I'll explain. Many years ago, when you, whichever you are, were a baby, you, whichever you are, were married to a little girl who has grown up to be the most beautiful girl in Spain. That young lady will be here to claim you, whichever you are, in half an hour. And I congratulate that one, whichever it is, with all my heart. <laughs> married when a baby? But we were married three months ago. One of you. Only one. The other is an unintentional bigamist. Well, upon my word! Yeah. Who are these young people? Who are we? Why, they're wives, of course! We've just arrived! Wives? Oh dear, this is very awkward. <laughs> oh dear, this complicates matters. Dear, dear, what will Her Majesty say? And do you mean to tell me that one of these monarchs was already married? And that <laughs> neither of us will be queen? That is the idea I intended to convey. Oh, Tessa, my dear, dear child. Get away! Perhaps it was you! My poor, poor little woman. Don't! No suits husband, you are! And Why didn't you tell us all about it before they left Venice? Because if I had, no earthly temptation would have persuaded these gentlemen to leave two such extremely fascinating and utterly irresistible little ladies. There's something in that. <laughs> I may remind you, you'll not be kept long in suspense. 
as the old lady who nursed the royal child is at present in the torture chamber, <laughs> waiting for me to interview her. Poor oh, old girl. Hadn't you better go and put her out of her suspense? Oh, no, no, she's all right. She has all the illustrated papers. <laughs> I'll go and interrogate her, and in the meantime, might I suggest the absolute propriety of your regarding yourselves as single young ladies? Good evening. Sheer pleasant state of things. Delightful. One of us is married to two young ladies, and nobody knows which. And the other is married to one young lady whom nobody can identify. One of us is married to one of you, and the other is married to nobody? <laughs> but which of you is married to which of us, and what's to become of the other? It's quite simple. <clears throat> Observe. Two husbands have managed to acquire three wives. Let's see, it's three wives, it's two husbands. That's two thirds a husband to each wife. <laughs> oh, Mount Vesuvius, here we are in arithmetic. My good sir, one cannot marry a vulgar fraction. Hey! You've no right to call me a vulgar fraction. <laughs> We are getting rather mixed. The situation is entangled. Let's try and comb it out. In a contemplative fashion and a tranquil frame of mind, free from every kind of passion, some solution let us find, let us grasp the situation, solve the complicated plot, quiet, calm deliberation, disentangles every knot. I no doubt Giuseppe married, that's of course a slice of luck. He is rather dunderhead, and still distinctly he's a duck. I think to talk to him, my own Mary, that is funny. He's going to give him a stupid step, and think he's a dear. To Jeff that I was mated, I can prove it. In a trice, all her charms are overrated, still I hope she Nice. I too test how very dearly all at once a victim fell. She is what is called a silly, still she answers pretty well. She's a silly, still she answers pretty well. Now the people pity, maybe someone married us, that's clear. And if I can catch her own picture, it's better and send her away with the flea in her ear. If I overtake her, I'll warrant a make to shake her hair, so glad to she's married and she's If I have to do it, I'll warrant she'll root. I'll teach her to marry the man of my heart. If she marries better, Marco, you're a spinster. That's the matter, and I can get at her and doubt her mother will never again. If I have to do it, I'll warrant you'll teach her to marry the man of my heart.
attention touches heart of duke and heart of duchess who resign with profound regret she of beauty was a model when a tiny tiddle toddle and at twenty one she's excelled by none at twenty one she's excelled by Be good enough to inform His Majesty that His Grace, the Duke of Plaza Toro, Limited, has arrived and begs. Desires. Demands! And demands an audience. And now, my child, prepare to receive the husband to whom you're united under such interesting and romantic circumstances. But which is it? There are two of them. Yes, it is true that His Majesty is a double gentleman. But as soon as the circumstances of his marriage are ascertained, he will, ipso facto, boil down to a single gentleman, thus presenting a unique example of an individual who becomes a single man and a married man by the same operation. I have known instances in which the characteristics of both conditions existed concurrently in the same individual. Ah, he couldn't have been a Plaza Toro. Ah, couldn't he have? <laughs> well, whatever happens, I shall of course be a dutiful wife, but I can never love my husband. Oh, I don't know. It's extraordinary what unprepossessing people one can love if one gives one's mind to it. <laughs> I love your father. <laughs> My love, that remark is a little hard, I think. Rather cruel, perhaps. Somewhat uncalled for, I venture to believe. It was very difficult, my dear, but I said to myself, that man is a duke. And I will love him. Several of my relations bet me I couldn't, but I did. Desperately. <laughs> On the day when I was wedded to your admirable sire, I acknowledged that I dreaded an explosion of his ire. I was overcome with panic, for his temper was volcanic, and I didn't dare revolt, for I feared a thunderbolt. I was always very wary, for his fury was ecstatic, his refined vocabulary most unpleasantly emphatic. To the thunder of this tartar, I knocked under like a martyr. When Intently he was fuming, I was gently unassuming. When reviling me completely, I was smiling very sweetly. I was smiling very sweetly, very sweetly. Giving him the very best and getting back the very worst. That is how I tried to tame your great progenitor at first. Giving him the very that is how I try to tame your great progenitor at first. But I found that our reliance on my threatening appearance and the resolute defiance of marital interference and the gentle intimation of my firm determination to see what I could do to be wife and husband too was the only thing required more to make his temper supple and you couldn't have desired a more reciprocating couple ever willing to be wooing we were billing, we were cooing ah. when I merely from him parted we were nearly broken hearted 
upon 95 quarterings? You know, it is not every nobleman who is 95 quarters in arrear. I mean, who can look back upon 95 of them? And this, just as I have been floated at a premium. Oh, bye. Your Majesty is surely unaware that directly your Majesty's father came before the public. He was applied for over and over again. My dear, her Majesty's father was in the habit of being applied for over and over again, and very urgently applied for too, long before he was registered under the Limited Liability Act. To help unhappy commoners and add to their enjoyment, affords a man of noble rank congenial employment. Of our attempts we offer you examples illustrative. The work is light, and I may add, it's most remunerative. <coughs> Small titles and orders for mares and recorders I get, and they're highly delighted. MPs, baronetted, sham colonels gazetted, and second rate aldermen knighted. Yes, aldermen knighted. Foundation stones laying, I find very pain. It adds a large sum to my making. Large sums to his makings. At charity dinners, the best of speech spinners, I get 10% on the taking. One tenth of the takings. I present any lady whose conduct is shady or smacking of doubtful propriety. Doubtful propriety. When virtue would quash her, I take and whitewash her and launch her in first rate society. First rate society. I recommend acres of clumsy dressmakers, their feet and their finishing touches. Their finishing touches. A sum in addition they pay for permission to say that they make for the Duchess. They make for the Duchess. Those pressing prevailers, the ready-made tailors, quote me as their great double barrel. Their great double barrel. I allow them to do so, though Robinson Crusoe would jib at their wearing apparel. Such wearing apparel! I sit by selection upon the direction of several companies bubble. All companies bubble. As soon as they're floated, I'm freely bank noted. I'm pretty well paid for my trouble. He's paid for his trouble. At middle-class party I play at a carte and I'm by no means a beginner. She's not a beginner. To one of my station the remuneration, five guineas a night and my dinner. And wine with her dinner. <laughs> I'll per patent on medicines, patent and use any other, you mustn't. Believe me, you mustn't. And while my complexion derives its perfection from somebody's soap, which it doesn't. It 
it certainly doesn't. We're ready as whispers to anyone's fitness to fill any place of preferment. A place of preferment. We're often in waiting at junket or fating, and sometimes attend an interment. We enjoy an interment. In short, if you kindle the spark of a swindle, who is simple to tear to your clutches, your skin to your clutches. Or hold me for debtor, you cannot do better than trot out a duke or a duchess. A duke or a duchess. Majesties. Your Majesty. The Duke of Plazatoro, I believe. The same. <laughs> Allow me to present to you the young lady one of us married. myself to the gentleman whom my daughter married. The other may allow his attention to wander if he likes, for what I am about to say does not concern him. Sir, you will find in this young lady a combination of excellences you would search for in vain in any other young lady who had not the good fortune to be my daughter. There is a little doubt as to which of you is the gentleman I am addressing and which is the gentleman who is allowing his attention to wander. But when that doubt is solved, I shall say, still addressing the attentive gentleman, take her and may she make you happier than her mother has made me. <laughs> And now, there is a little matter to which I think I am entitled to take exception. You see, I come here in state with Her Grace the Duchess and Her Majesty my daughter. And what do I find? Do I find, for instance, a guard of honor to receive me? No. No. The town illuminated? No. 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 Refreshments provided? No. 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 A royal salute fired. No. No. Triumphal arches erected. No. No. The bell set ringing. No. Yes, one, the visitors, and I ring it myself. <laughs> it is not enough. It is not enough. Upon my honor, I am very sorry. But you see, I was brought up in a gondola. And my ideas of politeness are confined to taking off my cap to my passengers when they tip me. That's all very well in its way, but it is not enough. I'll take anything else off in reason. <laughs> but a royal salute to my daughter. It costs so little. Papa, I don't want a salute. My dear sir. As soon as we know which of us is entitled to take that liberty, she shall have as many salutes as she likes. And as for guards of honor and triumphal arches, you don't know our people. They won't stand for it. They're very offhand with us. Very offhand indeed. Mm. Oh, but you mustn't allow that. You must keep them in proper discipline. You must impress your court with your importance. You want deportment, carriage. Oh, we've got carriage. Manner, dignity, there must be a good deal of this sort of thing. And possibly a little of this sort of thing. And just a sousson of this sort of thing. Oh, it is very useful and most effective. Just attend to me. You are a king. I am a subject. Very good. I am a courtier, grave and serious, who is 
about to kiss your hand. Try to combine a pose imperious with a demeanor nobly bland. Let us combine a pose imperious with a demeanor nobly bland. That's if anything too unbending, too aggressively stiff and grand. Now to the other extreme you're tending, don't be so deucedly condescending. Now to the other extreme you're tending, don't be so dreadfully condescending. Oh, hard to please some noblemen seem, at first if anything too unbending. Off we go to the other extreme, too confoundedly condescending. Now a gavotte perform sedately, offer your hand with conscious pride. Take an attitude not too stately, still sufficiently dignified. Now an attitude not too stately, still sufficiently dignified. Oncely, twicely, oncely, twicely, bow impressively ere you glide. Capital ball, capital ball, you've caught it nicely. That is the style of being precisely. Capital ball, capital ball, you've caught it together. That's called tact. It's very awkward. We really ought to tell her how we are situated. It's not fair to the girl. Then why don't he do it? <laughs> I'd rather not. You! But I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> Madam, I... We, uh, that is, several of us. And gentlemen, I am bound to listen to you, but it is right to tell you that, not knowing I was married in infancy, I am over head and ears in love with somebody else. Huh. Our case exactly. We are over head and ears in love with somebody else, too. In point of fact, with our wives. Your wives? When you're married? It's not our fault. We knew nothing about it. We are sisters in misfortune. My good girls, I don't blame you. But before we go any further, we must really arrive at some satisfactory arrangement, or we shall get hopelessly complicated. Here is a case of unprecedented hierarchy.
equality, war of the soul, how can you call marriage a state of unity? Sweetly, I called him son. 